Hello, and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. Over the past few years, I have made a ridiculous amount of PCBs. Some of these were test boards, or some were for one-off projects, and others are prototypes. With my experience, I have come up with some tips for making it easier to test your circuits. Now, just a warning, this is not meant to be a step-by-step -step PCB design video. But even if you're new to them, you can learn some things along the way. Also, the tips I show here are intended for test or prototype boards. Not everything I show applies to a design for manufacturing. With that, let's go design. The paint or color you see on a board is called solder mask. Typically, PCB software assumes you want the solder mask everywhere except for pads where solder goes. So when drawing on the mask layer, it is a negative, meaning solder mask will not appear there. For example, on this board, this area uses multiple polygons to expose the substrate and the copper traces. In this example, I have used the technique to expose the ground plane as part of the Element 14 logo, which looks really great on a black PCB. As a more useful example, here I have exposed the edges of a board. These exposed strips are the ground plane. These make for a great place to touch a DMM lead or clip a scope probe. Just remember, if you expose the ground plane, especially on both sides of the board, you will have a ton of exposed copper when it's sitting on your bench. Here is a common problem. When you go to debug a board, you find the signal you want to look at, and then you need ground. But where is ground? I feel like I've already covered one way to do this. Let's take a look at another. While looking at a genuine Arduino Uno, I noticed that they marked the ground pins with a white stripe. So I have adopted the same idea. I put a large rectangle on the silk screen layer that covers the ground connection. On headers, make sure you extend it beyond the footprint's courtyard. And now here's that same board. I think you could agree it is very clear where the ground pins are located. Another option is to just add an extra circle or square around the appropriate pins. Just make sure you put them on both sides for through holes. This one tip alone can significantly improve the debugability of a board, but there are some other silk tricks that we should talk about. Okay, I do not do anything with the silk screens until I am done routing the board and that unrouted counter gets to the sweetest number in PCB design, zero. And then the first thing I do is change all of the text elements to be the same size. Next, I turn off the copper layers, but leave the mask and courtyard layers on so I can see where components are, but not get confused by the traces. Then I go through and move the silks around to make sure that they are visible and not too crowded. I also try to avoid having the silk cover up a via. When those are done, I add text labels to identify the pins of headers and other key parts. After that, for the through hole labels, I copy them to the back side of the board. Trust me, the first time you have to debug on the back of a board, you will thank me for this little tip. For LED indicators and test points, I like to add a label to identify their function. If space is a problem, then I usually hide their designator. Here's two more tips related to the silk screen. The first one, in my humble opinion, is the most critical. Ideally, on the top side, add a revision number or date. If you have to spin the board again, you need a quick reference to know which one you have in hand and second, add blocks of a filled polygon to write notes. For example, on these generic breakout boards, I added blocks next to the push buttons. That way, I can write the switch function on the board. You can also use those same silk blocks to ID boards from the same run during bring up. And by the way, what happens during bring up? Testing. If you ever took an introductory class to programming, there's no doubt the teacher said, make sure you add lots of good comments. For me, I always struggle with what are good comments. Well, test points are the comments of the hardware world. You should probably add them, but I'm going to guess you don't always know where. When space is of no concern, then add them to as many nodes as you can. If space is at a premium, then consider your circuit's critical path first. And because how you connect a scope's probe can affect measurements, add extra test points for ground. If there's room, add one ground point for every signal point. Now, there are at least three different types of test points that you can consider. The first one is just a blank pad that a probe can touch, and there are multiple sizes. Next is a dedicated hook for probes. My favorite to use are the surface mount style from Harwin. Last, you could just use 2.54 millimeter pitched connectors. 
header pins are cheap, or you can carefully stick a scope probe into the hole. The nice thing about these is that you get a test point on both sides. The only real downside is that they tend to be very big. On this board, I used the clippable Harwin and a tiny PCB-only test point. That way I can clip a scope probe lead to it or make use of the ground spring for a high bandwidth measurement. At least, that was the idea. In general, if you have room for even the one millimeter test point, add it. When drawing the schematic, just put test points everywhere. You can always delete them later. These are just a handful of my favorite tips. Which ones did you like or which ones would you like to offer? Let us know over on the Element 14 community. Remember, that is the best place to ask me questions because I monitor the comments over there, which means I'm able to answer them. As always, thank you for watching. For now, it is time for me to get back to meticulously routing critical signal paths on my electronics workbench.